Good morning. If you would please join with me in turning to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. I'm not going to continue to do this for much longer, but I did want to remind once again that Wednesday mornings at 6.30 in the seminary room, we now have men's discipleship. And it's just been a a real enjoyable time the last three weeks. Uh, We have a short time of testimony. One of the men will share his testimony of coming to faith in Christ briefly. Then we have a time of instruction. And then following that, we have a time of prayer together. And so if you haven't yet been able to come, we invite you to come. We'd enjoy for you to join with us uh, on Wednesday mornings at 630. So men, the invitation is, is to all of you. Ephesians 5 is where we are this morning and this evening. We're going to read beginning at verse 22 and we'll read down to verse 33. This is the word of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, And the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our time now in his word. Father in heaven, we do ask for your blessing upon this next hour. We recognize, Lord, that everything we will see this morning depends on the foundation of Christ Himself. Apart from Your Son, a a true saving relationship with Your Son, these things are impossible for us. And so I pray, Lord, for anyone in this room who doesn't know Your Son, that, Lord, even today might be the day when they recognize that Christ came into the world to save sinners and that they are a sinner and in need of the forgiveness that only Christ provides. And I pray that today would be a day of great salvation for some. And for all of us, Lord, who have been rescued by your Son, redeemed, made your own, I pray that today we would hear your word as having the authority that it has that we would come under the authority of the Scriptures and that we would embrace from our hearts the things that are given to us in these verses, that we would desire to please you in these things, that we would pursue obedience in these matters. And in that way, Lord, we would um, worship you as we should and enjoy you as we should. And so, Father, we pray for that kind of blessing this morning, correction where we need it, encouragement where we're in need of it, And in all of it, we pray that Christ would be exalted. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What we're going to think about today is this. Marriage is for sanctification. Marriage is for sanctification. Marriage is for your growth in Christ. All marriages, when you talk about a Christian, 
being involved in a marriage, whether you are married to another believer or not, whether you are the, the one believer in a marriage or you are a believer married to another believer, God means for your marriage to be a means that He uses to grow you in Christ. And I pray that by the time we're finished today, you would be absolutely convinced of that. Because I think there are too many people who think about their marriage. I'm thinking now about those who are involved in a difficult marriage. They think about their marriage as something to survive. They don't think about thriving in marriage. They don't think about being enriched by their marriage. They think about surviving their marriage. Marriage is not just about enduring. You know, last week we talked about forgiveness and forbearing. We talked about the grace of God and how it applies in marriage. And we, we did talk about enduring difficult things. But marriage is not just about enduring, it's about growing. And it's not just about you growing as an individual, but it's also about you making an investment in someone else's life. Mar marriage is about spiritual growth, not just for you as an individual, but it's also about a means that God has ordained by which you can invest in the spiritual growth of the person that you're married to. God has designed marriage not only that we might serve Christ together as husband and wife, but that we might grow in Christ together as husband and wife. So it's not just about covenant faithfulness. It's about the covenant goal. It's about the covenant goal that belongs to Christ's relationship to His church. Why did the Lord bring us into a relationship with Himself? It's not just to forgive our sins, to free us from the guilt of our sins and from the wrath of God that our sins deserve, but it's also that we might be conformed to the image of God's own Son. It's not just about rescue. It's about Christ-likeness. And so if we can remember that model, then we'll remember that our marriage is not just about surviving failure, but it's about conformity to a goal. It's about growing into a likeness that both husband and wife are destined for, the likeness of Christ Himself. Your marriage is for Christian growth. Your marriage is for sanctification. John Piper has written a wonderful little book on marriage called This Momentary Marriage. I would encourage you all to get it. This Momentary Marriage. In that, he, he says this. I th thought this was uh, very helpful. He says, God gives grace not only to forgive and to forbear, but also to change so that less forgiving and forbearing is needed. That, too, is a gift of grace. Grace is not just the power to return good for evil. It is also the power to do less evil, even power to become less bothersome. Grace makes you want to change for the glory of Christ and for the joy of your spouse. And grace is the power to do it. Close quote. Think about that. Grace makes you want to change for the glory of Christ and for the joy of your spouse. Is that what you want this morning? Do you want to change for the glory of Christ and do you want to change for the joy of the person that you're married to? Wherever change is needed, wherever you are not as Christ-like as you should be, do you desire for the Lord to change you for His glory? and for the joy of the person that you're married to. So all day, this morning and this evening, we're going to spend our time here, and we're going to be thinking about this. Marriage is for my sanctification, my growth in Christ. This morning, a big picture view of the passage. Tonight, we're going to descend down into the details. This evening, we're going to talk about specific ways in which husbands are to grow and help their wife grow in the Lord. Tonight, we'll talk about specific ways in which wives are to grow and help their husbands grow in the Lord. But this morning what I want us to think about is, is just the evidence from the passage that marriage is indeed for sanctification, that we have to grow, pursue Christ, worship Christ, and pursue Christ in our marriage relationship. 
And I want to give you four evidences of that from our verses this morning. So four evidences that marriage must be thought of as a means for progressive sanctification in the lives of believers. Here's the first one. We are reminded that marriage is for sanctification by the loveliness of the comparison. By the loveliness of the comparison or the model that is set before us. Marriage is compared to something. And the loveliness of the comparison reminds us that we must grow. The standard that is set before us is the standard of Christ's relationship to the church. That's the comparison. That's the model. And that standard that is set before us as the model is an impossibly high standard if not for the grace of God. We now, if if we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we can live this pattern, or this standard rather, as a pattern. But even though we've been saved, we can't live this standard in perfection. As a husband, I can look at how Christ relates to His church, and I can say, Lord, by Your grace, may You make this the pattern of my life. May I, as a pattern, love Jackie in a way that reflects Christ's love for me. Would you make this a pattern in my life? But sadly, on this side of heaven, on this side of glorification, I will never be able to say that this is the perfection of my life. The the very model, the very standard points me to my need to grow every day because I cannot love her perfectly in the way that Christ loves His church perfectly. Every day there's some area where I know I need to grow. Every every day there's some issue wherein I'm reminded of my need to grow. In fact, even when I can say that I'm loving her as a pattern in a way that reflects Christ, I have to say that God regards my obedience graciously. In other words, he regards it as obedience because of his grace. Because even when I am obeying him, the weakness of my flesh, the weakness of my unredeemed humanity still is there to see. Even when I am obedient as a husband, I'm not perfectly obedient. She faces the same challenge. Because the model for her is the church, the church's relationship to her head. But as the church is considered in these verses, the church is not considered in her worst moments. The church is considered in her obedience to Christ. The church is considered positionally, and the church is considered in terms of where the church is headed. Verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, just stop there. Well, how does the church submit to Christ? This church, Founders Baptist Church, how does this church submit to Christ? Are we submitted to Christ perfectly? Is this church everything it ought to be? Is this church everything that one day it will be by the grace of God and the work of Christ himself? Aren't we in progress as a church? If you know that church, would you say amen? We're in progress, aren't we? We haven't arrived. So he's considering the church here positionally. The church, by virtue of Christ saving us, is in a position of submission to Christ. But we're also in progress, as we are reminded of in in verse 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Well, that's true positionally right now. We've been justified, been declared right with God based upon the finished work of his son. But we are being sanctified, and one day we will be presented before Almighty God in Christ Jesus, perfected. In splendor, no spot, no wrinkle, no, anything like that, holy without blemish. This is Christ's work. So even as, as my wife considers how she's to relate to me by the model of the church's relationship to Christ, 
She can't say she's arrived at where the church will one day be. We're all part of that church. We're not yet glorified. She's not yet glorified. So she's in progress just like the church is in progress. I look to Jesus as my model. I see how much I need to grow. She can look at the church positionally and the church's future perfection, and she will see just how much she needs to grow. Which means that neither of us can feel very comfortable when looking at the comparison. The loveliness of the comparison humbles us, shows us our weakness, shows us just how far we are from where we want to be, where we should be, and one day where we will be in Christ Jesus. It's amazing, isn't it, that anybody could look at Ephesians chapter 5, these verses, and use it as ammunition to criticize the person they're married to. Isn't this how, how these verses are sadly often used? Dear wife, you should submit to me like the church is submitted to Christ and you are not submitted to me like that. Well, dear husband, you're to love me like Christ loves the church and you do not love me like that. Far too often we look at these verses and what we're doing is we're looking at this is where you fail. This is where you fall short. This is where you are not what you were meant to be. And I'm convinced if we're looking at these verses rightly, they will cause us to pity each other, to be patient with each other, to pray for each other, to encourage each other, to invest in each other because I can't see where she falls short of the standard without first seeing how far I fall short of the standard. Can I really look at how Christ loves the church and not see that I need to grow in how I love my wife? And if she's looking honestly at the standard, can she really just focus on how I'm not loving her without asking, I wonder, am I relating to my spiritual head in the way that the church is the model for how it's to relate to Jesus. There is something, though, very encouraging in the model, the loveliness of the model, because Christ has not taken us, His church, to Himself for just a time. He has taken us to Himself for forever. He has justified us. His work has justified us with God. And now we are being sanctified and one day we're going to arrive at, at the goal for which He has saved us. He is, he is moving us toward what is our inevitable end and He will never let go of us along the way. Even in our unfaithfulness, He proves Himself to be faithful. There is, in other words, there is permanence in this relationship. That's a model for our marriages also, you know. One man with one woman for how long? For life, right? Marriage is not eternal. It's temporary. It belongs to this age. No marriage or giving in marriage in heaven, in the eternal state. But it's still one man with one woman for the, for the length of their lives. What this means is now there is, there is the safety within which we can grow together. We're not threatening each other. We're not saying, now, if you, if you don't grow into what God means for you to be, there's going to come a time when I'm done with you. No, I know that she's committed to me as I'm striving to grow in Christ. In my best moments, in my worst moments, in the times when I succeed in terms of what is in my heart to strive for, in the, in the times when I'm an utter failure, in terms of what is in my heart to strive for, she is committed to me regardless, and I'm committed to her regardless. I love her unconditionally. I'm committed to her now unconditionally, and she is committed to me. We are in this relationship permanently. 
until death parts us. That's what we promised. That's what we vowed to God and to each other. For better, for worse, in sickness and health, in poverty or in riches, we're in this relationship for life. Again, Piper said it well. He said, rugged, rugged covenant-keeping commitment based on grace gives security and hope so the call for change can be heard without feeling like a threat. Right? If Jackie says to me, hey, here's an area where you need to grow, it's not a threat. It's given in the context of grace. He goes on to say this, only when a wife or husband feels that the other is totally committed, even if he or she doesn't change, can the call for change feel like grace rather than an ultimatum. Are you committed to the person you're married to even if they don't change? Do you love them even if they don't change? So that if you are serving Christ and serving them by pointing out areas where they need to change, is it heard like grace instead of like an ultimatum? So the first way that these verses speak to my heart and to your heart about our need for growth is the loveliness of the comparison. The beauty of Christ's love for His church is a model for husbands, and the beauty of the church's submission to her Lord is the model for wives. The loveliness of that picture says, we are not there yet, brethren. We have to grow together in Christ. Second, we are reminded that marriage is for sanctification by the limitations of the comparison. We're looking really at the same motivation, but from a different perspective. The, the perfection of the model is, is, this, is still the motivation, but now we look at it from a different perspective. Our need to grow is driven home by the way that Paul now applies the standard. The standard is Christ in the church. How does he apply it? Wives, verse 22, submit to your own husband's Here's a, a key little word used throughout the section, the little word as. As to the Lord. Your husband is not the Lord. But your submission to him should picture the kind of submission that one would give to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, and on it goes, as, as, as Christ loved the church, as the church submits to Christ. Christ is the example for me, but I'm not Christ. The church in her ideal state is the model for the wife, but the wife is not yet glorified. The wife is not yet in her ideal state. In fact, when you get to the end of this instruction, this is driven home in verses 32 and 33. He says, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. There's something greater and there's something that's being instructed by the greater. The greater story here, the, the truest story of love here is not a husband's love for his wife or the wife's love for her husband. The greater story is Christ and the church. And then we are instructed by that greater story. We are guided by that greater story. You say, well, how does this instruct you about growth? Well, when I, when I remember that I'm, I'm to love as Christ loved the church, but I'm not Christ, that's encouraging to my heart because 
not only is Christ my model, but now He is also my helper. I am not the Lord. I need the Lord. (laughs) To be anything like the Lord, I need the Lord. And so He will not just be my model. He's going to have to be, and He is, thanks be to God, my teacher, my guide, my strengthener, the one who's at work in my life and through my life as I strive to walk in His example. And when Jackie thinks about the church in in her ideal state as a model for her behavior toward me, she's not yet in an ideal state. She is not yet glorified. But here's the good news. The same one who saved the church and is saving the church and will glorify the church is available to her as he helps her become more and more of what she's going to be one day in her ideal state. The fact that the little word as is used throughout the section reminds us that we must look to the Lord to be like the Lord and like His church in its ideal state and fulfill this instruction. Christ is the one perfecting the church. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her that He might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the words, that he might present the church, he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The wife needs the one who died to make a perfect bride. And I need the one who loved that bride in a self-sacrificing way in order to make her perfect. We both look to the Lord even as we look to Him as our model. We look to the Lord as our teacher and guide and strengthener, the one who's at work in us to produce in us that which pleases Him. So the limitations of the comparison remind me of my need to grow. Third, we're reminded that marriage is for sanctification by the unlimited application of the comparison. The comparison is limited, but it's unlimited in terms of its application to the church, unlimited in terms of its application to believers. Wives, verse 22, not some wives, all wives, all Christian wives. This is God's call upon your life. Husbands, verse 25, not some husbands, all Christian husbands. In fact, driven home in verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife, each wife, see that she respects her husband. The passage makes clear, doesn't it, that this instruction is for every Christian who's married? No one is accepted. No one can opt out. Every married Christian hearing my voice must view your marriage relationship as a theater within which you worship Christ and grow in Christ. Every single one of you. Your marriage is for sanctification. Your marriage is where Christ is to be worshipped and where He is to be served, where He is to be obeyed. No one hearing me who knows Jesus can say, I'm not going to do that and be faithful to Jesus. Can I just ask you, brother, sister, are you, are you currently viewing your marriage that way? Or to put it negatively, is there somebody listening to me that you have felt justified in opting out of the pursuit of Christ-likeness in your marriage? Put it even more simply, we could say, you've given up. You've given up. 
what you've decided to do is to partition your marriage relationship out as something separate from your walk with Jesus. You've said to yourself, I I love the Lord and and I'm called to serve the Lord and I'm going to serve the Lord, but my marriage relationship is in such a state that now it is this separate thing. It is what it is. It's always going to be what it is. I can't envision it ever changing from what it is. And so what I've decided to do is just treat that as a separate part of my life and I'll pursue Jesus in every other part of my life. There's my walk with Jesus, and then there's my marriage. You ever seen someone make that decision? Can I tell you, I've seen lots of people make that decision. Wives, husbands who've decided, they've tried long enough, they've tried hard enough, their efforts just didn't work. And so, here's the key, they just don't give it much effort anymore. They really don't give it much effort anymore. Anger, bitterness, hopelessness, discouragement, weariness. Those things are used as an excuse to sort of put your spouse at arm's length. Not even interact with them more than you just have to. And then you're going to live for Jesus over here. I want you to know this morning, God will not sign off on your arrangement. Did you hear me? That is not acceptable to Him. You can try to delude yourself into believing that's acceptable to Him. You can try to convince yourself that you really are walking with Jesus while you ignore your marriage relationship. But I want you to know on the authority of God's Word, God does not sign off on your arrangement. You are deluded. You are deceived. If you believe that you are honoring Jesus while you have stopped pursuing Jesus in the way you relate to your spouse, You are blind. You must worship Christ. You must pursue Christ in your marriage relationship, even if it is a difficult one. Even if it seems to be an impossible one. Now, someone might ask, but what do I do if they don't engage me? What do I do if, if they have, have become so frustrated with me, they've sort of put me over into this other category? I think the answer of Scripture is you would, you would still be accountable to pursue Christ-likeness in the way you relate to them. They mistreat you, pursue Christ-likeness. They ignore you, Pursue Christ likeness. The passage says, Let each one of you love his wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. Do you, do you imagine that no one in the church at Ephesus had a marriage that seemed hopeless? No one in the church at Ephesus was weary in the realm of marriage. No one in the church at Ephesus was discouraged about their marriage. No one in the church at Ephesus was mistreated in their marriage. You'd be wrong to think that. And yet each and every believer hearing this letter read to the congregation would have come under the responsibility to live out these truths. And so it is here this morning. I may be speaking to someone who's discouraged. I may be speaking to someone who's weary. I may be speaking to someone who's given into hopelessness. And I want to encourage you this morning by reminding you Christ is at work. He's at work in your life. He's at work in in and through your marriage to develop you into the image of His Son, whether you can feel that or not. And you are still responsible to live out these truths no matter how difficult your marriage is. 
And so when I consider the unlimited way in which this model is applied to believers, now I'm reminded that every one of us must grow. All of us must pursue Christ-likeness in our marriage relationship, no matter the condition of our marriage. So the beauty of the comparison, the loveliness of it, says I've got to grow. The limited nature of it, I'm not Christ, my wife isn't the church glorified, that means we've got to grow. And we have not just the model, we have the teacher, the shepherd, the helper available to work in our lives and help us grow in these areas. And then the unlimited way in which it's applied, I can't opt out. I can't say this isn't speaking to me. I can't say that I'm the one person who doesn't have to worship Christ and pursue Christ in a marriage. I must live this out. All this says that I've got to grow, that marriage is indeed for my sanctification. Fourth, we're reminded that marriage is for sanctification by the living out of the comparison. What do you mean, Richard? I mean, you're going to know that you need to grow as soon as you really try to live this. Brother, love your wife as Jesus loved the church. Strive for that sincerely. Strive for that conscientiously. I mean, be honest about whether you are or you're not doing that. Strive for that consistently. Every day, in every circumstance, every interaction, you do that and you will immediately be introduced to your sinfulness, to your need to... The only way you can look at this standard and not think you need to grow is to be dishonest with the standard. And dear lady, you strive sincerely, conscientiously consistently to relate to your husband in a way that would picture the church in the beauty of what she's designed to be and destined to be. You have that as your model and you strive to live in accordance with that model and you will immediately be introduced to your sinfulness and to your need to grow. <laughs> All you have to do to know you need to grow is just strive to live this. And tonight, as I said, we're going to get into the specifics of how husbands are meant to grow in marriage. Let me just take a step back and say this. The order that is in these verses is strategic to our spiritual growth. So here's what else we can't do. We can't say, well, I, I want to grow in the Lord. I just don't want to pay attention to this headship submission stuff. I want to grow in the Lord, but I, I don't want to think about what it means to be a spiritual leader in my home. I don't want to think about what it means to be a spiritual helper in our relationship. We want to cast off the structure. We want to cast off the order, but we still want to grow in the Lord. No. No, the structure is strategic, indispensable, non-negotiable. You're not growing in the Lord unless you embrace biblical headship. You're not growing in the Lord unless you embrace biblical submission. You're just playing a mind game with yourself. It's in the structure. It's in the functional order in which husbands and wives are meant to grow. And so tonight we're going to talk about ways that husbands are meant to grow and help their wife grow, ways that wives are meant to grow and help their husbands grow. But I can say this this morning, just in general terms, you strive to live this out and what we saw last week in Colossians 3, you're going to see just how much you need these graces. Remember what we saw last week, Colossians 3 verse 12? Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. What do you put on? Compassionate hearts. You tenderhearted toward each other. Kindness. Humility. Meekness. Patience bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. 
And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You begin to strive to live out this model, and you're going to see how much you need tenderheartedness, how much you need kindness, how much you need humility, how much you need meekness and patience, how you're going to have to endure each other in love, how you're going to have to forgive each other in love, how you're going to have to love each other. Mark this down in your thinking. Here's what this means. Far from a difficult marriage making Christian growth impossible. Right? It's how people think sometimes. I just can't grow in the Lord because of the person I'm married to. I'd be doing so much better in the Lord, except for them. Instead of a difficult marriage making it harder for you to grow, a difficult marriage makes unmistakable the fact you need to grow. That's not an argument for difficult marriages, by the way. Why don't we all just make our marriages more difficult and then we'll all see how much we need to grow? Now, what I'm saying to you is, though, we've got to get rid of those satanic lies, don't we? Wow, if I just was in a different marriage relationship, I would really be growing spiritually. No, listen. Even if you're in a difficult marriage relationship, here's what this means. You're going to, ju- you're going to see how much you need to grow. Which is why all marriages, those that are honoring God because of their obedience and those that are struggling right now, in all marriages, marriage is for sanctification. So let me finish this morning with six questions I want you to go home with, all right? Six questions, and you can shorthand these. You don't have to write them all out. But I'd make a note so you can remember them and think about them this afternoon. We'll come back this evening and continue. Here's the first one I would ask you. Have you been giving much thought to your marriage as a relationship in which Christ is to be worshipped and pursued? Okay, I'm asking you, have you been thinking about your marriage specifically as a relationship in which you are to be worshiping Christ and pursuing Christ. God is right here. It's ground zero at home in my relationship with this person that I'm looking at face to face every day. Right here is where I'm to worship my Savior. Right here is where I'm to pursue obedience to Christ. Second, have you been giving much thought to how your marriage is a means ordained by God for your own spiritual growth? Have you been thinking about your marriage as, Lord, this is where you want me to grow? I mean, it's not the only place, but it's such a strategic place because I'm coming in contact with it every day. This is a way that you've ordained for me to see where I need to grow, and it's a way you've ordained for me actually to get to put the truth into practice every day. This is a relationship in which I am meant to grow spiritually. I think sometimes we like spiritual growth better in theory than in practice. Oh, Lord, would you help me to grow spiritually? Yes, sir. Let's start with your marriage. I wasn't talking about that, Lord. How about something else? So we like it in theory. We don't like it in practice. Have you been thinking about your marriage? This is where the Lord means for me to grow spiritually. Third, have you been giving much thought to your marriage as a means ordained by God for you to make a spiritual investment in the life of another person? Use me, Lord. Use me to impact someone else's life spiritually. Use me, Lord, in someone else's life. We love that theoretically, don't we? Okay, let's start with your marriage. How might I use you to impact that person you're married to for my glory, for their good? If you thought about your marriage as the place where you can make where the Lord can use you to make a spiritual investment in the life of another person. How can 
I invest spiritually in the salvation, if that's the need, or the growth of another person right here, right here in this relationship. Let, let me not just talk the gospel, let me live the gospel right here. Isn't that what 1 Peter 3 teaches to a wife who's married to a disobedient husband? That she can win him without a word as he sees her pure and respectful conduct, as he sees her love for Christ made concrete in the way she relates to him. That's true for a wife married to a disobedient husband. We also know there are some husbands married to disobedient wives. And the question is, are you thinking about how you might live Christ's love for his church in a way that would be used by God to impact her spiritually? And do you understand the blessing of being faithful in these things, even if in the realm of time, it never works out the way we hoped. In other words, let's envision a, a, a woman married to a disobedient husband. 1 Corinthians 7 says that she doesn't know whether she'll ever win him or not, which is why if an unbeliever wants to leave you, let them leave. But here she is now investing her entire married life in living out the faith before her husband. He never comes to faith in Christ. I want to ask you, was that wasted? Was that wasted? What's the answer? No. Why? Who are you serving? Who are you serving? You're serving Christ. How are you growing? You're growing in Christ. And the same is true for a husband married to a disobedient wife. Though you love her like Christ loves the church and she never sees it, never appreciates it, never returns it, it is not wasted because you're serving Christ. Fourth, have you believed a satanic lie that says that you have a right to opt out of giving full effort to your marriage relationship? Is there somebody listening to me that you've, you have given up? Maybe not completely, but to a degree. You've somehow given yourself permission to stop living according to these standards because of the way you've been treated or because of your disappointment in your spouse or because it seems like they're not changing. So you've given yourself permission. You've said, this no longer really applies to me. I'm going to partition out my marriage relationship. I'm going to serve Jesus in all these areas over here. And whatever happens here in marriage just happens. I'll pray about it. Ask the Lord to change it. But I really don't see how it's changed or is changing. And so when it comes to these commands, I'm limited in how I can live them out because of the condition of my marriage over here. Can I tell you, that is a satanic lie. You are responsible to live out these truths as much as depends on you, regardless of how the other person responds. I've used an illustration many times in counseling. I've said to people, listen, you can, it's like a tennis match. You can only play the ball when it's on your side of the net. You don't play tennis by hitting the ball, jumping the net, and hitting it back to yourself. What do you do? When the ball's on your side of the net, you hit it. And that's what you have to do in every relationship, including marriage. You hit the ball when it's on your side of the net. What is your responsibility? What has God told you to do? Now, you do that, and you don't do it arrogantly, like, okay, I'm doing my part. Now, you do it humbly. Lord, when I see the comparison that's set before me, the loveliness of it, I don't measure up. I don't measure up. I, I must grow. And so with a, a humble heart, you keep hitting the ball, keep hitting the ball, and you leave what happens on the other side of the net to the Lord. You pray for them, you love them, but you still have to leave them in the hands of the only one who can really change any of us. And that's the Lord. But if you believe that now you have a right to opt out of that, because you've given it your best effort for a really long time. Fifth, have you believed a satanic lie that says that a difficult marriage makes Christian growth difficult instead of seeing that it makes the need for Christian growth unmistakable. In fact, maybe there's somebody listening to me, you've even contemplated getting out of your marriage. You've entertained the thought of what it'd be like to be married to somebody else. 
I mean, you talk about the, the way Satan deceives people. The thought of breaking covenant and committing adultery in the name of having a more Christ-honoring marriage. If I got out of this one and got into another one, I'd really be honoring Jesus then. What a lie. Would you today recognize that as a lie? Would you reject it and say to yourself, Lord, it is, it is hard sometimes. But what's sweet, even in the difficulty, is my relationship with you. And I pray that if I am destined to pursue you in a difficult marriage for the rest of my life, that the result would be that you would conform me to the image of your own character. Lord, use the difficulties for my progress. Last question. Will you worship Christ by loving the person you're married to no matter what? Would you worship Jesus today by loving the person you're married to no matter what? No matter what comes. No matter the challenges. Love them for the Lord's sake. Love them because Christ loves it when you love them. I think it's obvious, isn't it? That you can't live this without the one who commands it. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, this is not in your heart to do. Even if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, sometimes you have to battle the flesh. You need Christ to honor Christ. And maybe today that's what really stands out, is that there's someone here today that this really hasn't been in your heart to do because you don't have the one who commands it. And your chief end in life is not to honor Him anyway. You've been living for you. And I wonder if today, if that has become apparent, would you repent of your sins and recognize your lost condition and trust Christ for life. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you that even in our marriage life, there is the opportunity and the design that you've designed for us to be conformed to the image of your Son. That is the ultimate destiny of every believer in this place. That is really why we're here. This is why we live, to please Christ. And so I pray in all the relationships of our life, including our marriage, we would lift our eyes up and see beyond the merely human elements of the relationships that we have and see your purpose in and through it all that we would worship your Son and pursue your Son in the way that husbands and wives live with each other. And we would do this, Lord, as individuals. Though we walk together, we have individual choices to make. That we would say within our hearts this morning, I will love the person I'm married to for Christ's sake, no matter what. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.